then the, the finalists present and then the um, the grantees are selected and awarded. So that's a very high, high, um, high level overview for you. And just to pull out a couple of dates, um, April 2nd is when the actual grant amount will be announced. So um, look out for that announcement and then your actual grant applications are due by June 1st. So we have five focus areas, and those uh, focus areas are, the, are what the grant applications will be accepted into. You need to choose one that best aligns with your project. So there are five, arts and culture, children and families, education, environment, parks and recreation, and health and wellness. And the definitions are there, um, they are all self-explanatory, so I'm not going to go through each one, but those are the five focus areas. The impact we have funding priorities, and we're looking to fund projects or programs that target underserved populations, highlight unmet needs in our area, and have a high impact on the beneficiaries. And I'm delighted that we're going to have for you today, which is an addition to our info sessions from last year, our three grantees here to share their experience with you. And one of the questions we'll be putting to them is how they spoke to these funding priorities in their application. So the steps in the application process, again, very high level, but just to give you a sense from your perspective, step one, you'll be submitting an eligibility quiz. So this is in place for a letter of intent or a letter of inquiry. We don't do that. What we have is via our website, an eligibility quiz to make sure that you're not going to do a full application and waste your time because you're not eligible. And so we ask that you submit that by no later than May 18th. The next step is you'll submit your application online. So once we confirm your eligibility, we send you your application link, and that allows you access to your application. You can't get access before then. We do, in the interest of transparency, have a copy, a draft on our website, which will be posted imminently. Um, so you can see the questions, and also, I'll come to this in a bit, um, but your app, as you go through the application and complete it, you can save your work as you go. But you will receive the link and submit the application by June 1st. If chosen for a site visit, that's your opportunity to give more in-depth information to the committee. And then the next final stage would be, if you're chosen as a finalist, you present your project at the annual membership meeting. So that's the perspective from you as an applicant. And we did have some feedback. Um, and I do want to say thank you so very much to those of you who completed our uh, survey. Um, that feedback is so helpful for us and we do review all of the results that come in before today to try to incorporate all of your input and your feedback before today. And one of the things was it's very applicant focused but we'd actually like a little insight into what's happening behind the scenes from your, you know, the, the members' perspective. So this really is mirroring the steps that I've just gone through but from the point of view of impact. So as a grant team, the executive team will actually go through and make sure that you're eligible. So that's self-explanatory. Step two is when you'll get your application, you'll complete your application. The members will then individually review your applications. And we have an evaluation tool and we have training, but they will do that on an individual basis. And then then come together to collaborate and, decision and collaboratively decide on who will be selected for site visit. Um, they then select a sub um, a subgroup of that committee, site visit representatives, who then go and, and conduct that site visit with a nonprofit. And they are then responsible for coming back to the wider committee to report their findings. And then again, the whole committee collaboratively decides on who they'll put forward as a finalist. So eligibility. Um, I think many of you will be aware, uh, aware of these already, having been through the process. So I'm not going to go through every single one, um, but just broadly, the eligibility criteria, um, they are fairly standard, but these are the organizational eligibility. You do need to be a 501c3, 
And as Deirdre mentioned, this is about local, local, local. So you need to be operating in Monmouth County and serving Monmouth County residents with your project. Um, and the, the next three, just to give you a rationale behind uh, these three uh, requirements, it's a sizable grant and we want to set you up for success and we also want to be able to, you know, for our members to know that the organizations have a, a, an infrastructure and the resources to manage a sizable grant. So we ask that you're in operation for a minimum of 36 months prior to applying, that you possess two years of financial statements, ideally audited or reviewed, and also you have a minimum annual operating budget of $100,000. And again, that's just to the reassurance that it's an organization that can manage um, a, a grant of that size. Um, just to say, there are some impacts that have very different parameters for that, like a minimum of three million, for example. So we really have tried to put it at a point that we think is accessible to the nonprofits in Monmouth County, but then reassure our members that you're you're able to to handle a size uh, a grant. So just to pause there because while that is the, the requirement. There is an exception, and that is you may want to apply as a collaboration, which is where what, a two or more 501c3s are coming together to jointly manage and run the project. So in that case, you would have a lead organization, and they are the ones that submit the application, and they're the ones that become fiscal partner with IMPACT and sign the grant agreement. But you may have with the, with the two, one or two or more non-lead organizations, and in that case, the non-lead organization does not need to have been in operation for 36 months prior to applying and does not need to have that minimum operating budget requirement of $100,000. And that's really to encourage the younger, you know, the younger uh, less established organizations um, to, to collaborate, but also to be able to get access to, to impact funding. Um, so just wanted to point that out, and um, you know, it, it, as I said, you do need to have a lead organisation, which does meet the requirements that we just set out. So that's um, organisational level requirements. These are the project eligibility requirements. Again, the residents of and expend funds fully in Monmouth County. Um, be a new program, expand upon an existing program, or propose a new or expanded collaboration. The point of this really is that we really want um, to, um, to, to have a well-defined project. Um, have a total project budget with obviously equal or greater than the amount of the grant. Um, and you know, we really do, um, we, 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 we're, we're aware that you may have um, other funders. You just need to be clear that if it is the project total amount is greater, that you make clear what the, where that other funding is gonna come from. Um, plan to spend it within 24 months. So you can say 12 months, doesn't have to be the full 24, but that's the maximum time allowed to spend the grant. And then fit within one of the five focus areas, as I mentioned before. So this is um, the project that we do not provide grants for. And again, I'm not going to go through every single one. I can take questions at the end about these. Um, we do fund operating expenses. We understand you can't successfully deliver a project without operating expenses. However, they do need to be clearly associated with the project. Um, and just to mention on capital improvements or renovations to the property, um, if the organization, if you do not own the property, you do need to have a lease of at least five years when on applying. And that needs to be remaining, sorry, five years remaining on that lease. All right, so then you're going to submit your application. So once the eligibility form is submitted and confirmed, you'll receive uh, an email from us with your link to your application, as I mentioned. So when you go on to that, you'll see that it's from CFNJ, Community Foundation of New Jersey. And uh, just wanted to be clear, you are in the right place. We are a special project of Community Foundation of New Jersey. So they manage, they're our fiscal partner, they manage our administration, um, but all of the grants, decisions, designations are solely made by Jersey Tech uh, Impact 100 Jersey Coast. Um, so they house our online platform, which is Founders. We've been very blessed to be a user on their, on their account. 
um, free of charge. Um, so you'll go online and you'll see that that is the platform online. And it will look something like this. So you'll go on, create a new account, log on, you'll have a password, all of this will be in the, in the email that we send you. Click apply to begin the application process. And as I said, what's great about it is that you can save your work as you go. Just for those of you who have applied before, the application will be very similar to last year, but we do make an effort every year to review it with fresh eyes, go back and tweak it, refine it, streamline it in response to feedback from yourselves and from our members. So it may be slightly different, but largely the same. And again, we will be putting a copy of that on our website. So just to go back to our funding priorities in your application, because this is one of the, I'd say, key areas where you're being evaluated by the members. We're looking for proposals that clearly explain with evidence these three things. So target underserved populations. So clearly explain who this population is, in what way are they underserved, and how your project will specifically reach and serve them. Highlight unmet needs. In other words, tell us about the needs and how they're not currently being met by other service providers. That really resonates. And how it will have a high impact on beneficiaries. And we say, you know, Outputs is great. You're going to reach 300 more people or three more people, but the what, so what is the most important part of your application. It's part of the story, and it really makes it come alive. So that outcome, what actual, yeah, what, what is the effect of that is really, really key to, to bringing your application alive. And just to say, it could be that it's reaching this many more people, or it might be that it's that much more impactful on an individual. So we know how much feedback, how important feedback is to you all, and um, you know to that, to that to that point, I'm going to hand over to Betsy. Thank you very much, Rob. Okay. Good morning. I'm Betsy McKnight. Many of you have probably seen my name <laughs> uh, on your email. Yeah. So feedback. We we understand that everyone wants to know, um, you know, what we thought of your application, or you know, what happened, or where did it go. And we can't do this for every applicant, it's just not feasible. However, we did want to let you know the applications that tended to stand out. Um, and, and, and to that point, I would say the application is your first impression. So keep that in mind when you're doing it. This is how you were introduced to the committee. Um, and overall, I would say, don't make the committee work too hard to figure out what it is you're proposing and why. Um, be clear, concise, and have all your attachments. Um, complete applications um, really do have more weight. Um, clearly outline the issue and the need for the problem that's being addressed. Uh, clearly explain how your project's goals and outcomes are aligned with our funding priorities. This is one of the things we ask the committee members to really make sure that you align with what it is that we are trying to achieve and that you have defined goals and desired outcomes uh, that are achievable within 24 months. And then again, the, but the project budget is clearly the, the excuse me, tied to the deliverables as described in the application. It's really important that you apply in a area that fits your application. Don't try to be a square peg fitting into a round hole. We have savvy um, members who really do sort of see this. So don't try to play a members a numbers game and say, well, there might be more applicants in this area. Um, it won't work. <laughs> um, uh, so just you know, do something that makes sense for your for your organization. Now the proofreading. Uh, we don't want to be patronizing and say you know obviously it is a given, but I think it bears repeating because you would be amazed of what we see, and it really is kind of off putting. Mistakes uh, dissuade and distract from what you're trying to present. So I would suggest you know you proofread it hand it to at least one or two pe other people in your organization, somebody maybe who has nothing to do with the project and say, read this, does this make sense? Is, are there no typos? <laughs> um, again, with the, uh, with the project, we can't emphasize transformational enough. We really want to fund something that is gonna make a difference in our community. 
Uh, and why does the community need the project that you're proposing now? And how does it fit or solve a big hole in our community? Um, why, why should this be funded? Now, caveat, uh, I am not the finance person. She could not be here today, but I'm going to just give you sort of a high level overview on the financial information that we ask for. The required financial information is fairly standard. Uh, you, you know, your top five institutional donors, uh, your financial statements, uh, your organization's budget for the current year. Um, mainly what we're trying to do is to see that you are a financially secure organization that will use the funds wisely and efficiently. Your finance shows us your track record. So to that end, um, please, you know, no gaps. We want to be able to see, you know, year-to-date actual versus budgeted figures for the current uh, fiscal year. Um, and then 990s this year, this is new. We will get those from GuideStar. We know it was a little um, difficult. It's a long, it's a long um, form. So um, we will get them from GuideStar. If we have any issues, we will contact you. Uh, also, the financial narrative is now optional, but if you have some irregularities in your, um, in your financial um, documents, or let's say you, know, you had a banner year last year and it might appear like you don't need any money, well, you can show, you can explain how this is not really the case because something came in, but it's a one-time thing or anything that, um, that might stand out. And then again, the project budget, which you have handouts, which is the project budget template, and we ask that you please use those. Um, it really is helpful. Um, it lets us compare apples to apples, and it makes an even playing field for the board looking at one budget um, type for, for all organizations. Um, I think I'd mentioned no gaps. Um, this, again, comes sort of goes to the, uh, the less questions that we have about your finances. Um, the, the better off just kind of show us that you are financially um, sound and, um, and then that is very helpful. Again, it shows your, um, your track record. Um, the budget form also helps us compare apples to apples across the different areas. If you have any trouble uploading your financial statement, then please let us know sooner rather than later um, and we can make arrangements for you to email the documents to us. The project budget is it's an as important as uh, any other part of the or of the um, application. Um, it is scrutinized very carefully by our members, and it should be credible and well defined. Um, make sure that it's a budget uh, equals or exceeds the grant amount, that it adds up correctly both in total line and um, and, and line by line, and that the narrative and the budget match. Um, that what you say you're going to do, there's money behind it, and that it makes sense. If the project is dependent on other funding, please be sure to include the committed funds in the space. So, um, you know, if if you if your uh, grant, if this grant is not going to cover everything, just let us know um, how reassured you are that you have the money, so that, so that our committee can be reassured that the project would go forward. And then again, if it's ongoing, please let us know. Um, how you uh, expect to um, fund it on an ongoing basis. So the site visit, the organizations are notified and the site visits are scheduled. This is your opportunity to bring your uh, application to life. This is when um, you can really uh, put faces to names and let people know the personality of your organization and your commitment. Um, we will, uh, it's to, to do a due diligence, um, and it typically requires about two to three hours, and ideally you'll have your executive director, the project manager, and at least one board, board member there. And, and the new thing that we're, we're doing this year is that we're letting all organizations that receive a site that, that we recognize that you put a lot of work into us having them come there and host this. We're gonna put your uh, wish list. A lot of times relationships are also formed by um, the members who, who of uh, the focus area committee who go all the way to your organization and they get really, you know, become advocates for you. And some people want to know what else they can do. So these wish lists are a great opportunity to let the committee know what you can use from, um, from impact beyond just the, um, the grant if you should not um, receive it. Um,
So then the presentation. The finalists uh, present their project to the entire IMPACT membership at the annual membership meeting, and we do vote on it that night. Uh, the most important thing I would say here is to choose your most charismatic and high energy presenter. Uh, it may not be the person who's directly related to the project, but be dynamic. Get somebody who really can sell the project to the, uh, to the membership. Up until this point, yes, it has been about the numbers and the facts and everything else, and it still is, but the night of, um, people will change their minds even um, based on being swayed by the presenter. So I would say, you know, really you want to tell yourself that night. Uh, winning over the crowd makes a, makes a big difference. Um, the grant recipient is announced that night. You don't get the, a live check, but you do get a, a nice big uh, trophy check. And the wish list from all five finalists are distributed to members on our website and, um, and that evening. And then the post-grant recipient announcement. Um, you'll, we don't just get the money and run. You, there is a grant agreement uh, which outlines the fund distribution and the benchmark depending on your program timeline. We uh, do maintain, I'm actually on the reporting team as well, ongoing communication and there'll be quarterly uh, check-ins. And you do have an opportunity also to come back and interact with the membership uh, on things like this. We do have um, past um, recipients here and current recipients here who are gonna uh, speak with you about, about this. Um, and also you will come back the following year. So the benefits of the grant impact process it's exposure, basically. You are going to be exposed to families, literally hundreds of families, who are philanthropically funded, and you're going to be exposed to them through their most um, influential members, which is the women in the family. Um, they become aware of the needs and the great work that's being done in the community, and the site visit gives impact women additional insights into what, um, what everyone here is doing. Um, we have had many impact members, as I said, relationships are formed, and um, people do stay in contact with, with uh, applicants and they'll volunteer their time and, and, their, and their treasure and, and uh, their, their goods. Should you reapply? We, we polled before who's been in this room before, and uh, we recognize that, yes, it is, it is a, um, a time-intensive process, but I would say absolutely you should apply because the pool of applicants changes every year. So who you're up against is not gonna be the same year to year. And the focus area committee, so who uh, actually evaluates your application changes on a yearly basis. So you're not going to be evaluated by the same people that you were in prior years. And then finally the voters, the, the membership changes. So who actually decides at the end who gets the grant is gonna be different year to year. So I would say absolutely it makes sense to apply. Um, in fact, it was the second year of applying for one of our grant recipients um, this past uh, fall. And then we polled other grant uh, impact 100s around the country. And there's been a very high percentage of applicants who have applied year after year and then uh, received a grant. So I would definitely uh, encourage you to reapply. So the important dates are up here. I'm not gonna go through every single one, but as Ro did mention, the one that is of interest to most people in this room is the April 4th date, because that is when the eligibility questionnaire goes live, and that is your conduit to getting an application. So you will commit to submit your uh, eligibility um, quiz. We will go, we, we will go through it and uh, ensure your eligibility, and then you will be sent an application. Um, and that gives you um, the most amount of time because it is due by the June 1st. That is the, that is the hard deadline. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ro to introduce our panel. Thank you. Ashley, I wonder if we do Q&A on that first and then we'll do um, the panel then because I think maybe you might on the back of the presentation, if there are any questions, we can take those now. I'm going to try and do the microphone around the room so that we can hear you answer the questions you might. That would be great. Sorry, I lost my voice a little bit. Don't bear with me. Um, for a nonprofit that has multiple locations, like we have a home base, but we have sober living throughout Monmouth County, is that would you do a site visit to each location, or how does that work? 
So I think a case by case basis. So um, did everyone hear the question? Sorry. Multiple locations. <laughs> Um, without Crown Bombers County, where would the site visit take place? And it really would be up to you um, as to what would work best for you. Where would you like us to come? And um, you know, we'll work with, with every organization on a case-by-case -case basis. Some organizations don't have a site, you know, it just depends. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not sure. um, my question is regarding the uh, financial aspect of the application. So, 100,000 operating budget is that based on multiple years? Or is it one like how many years are you looking back in time? Um, actually, it's your current. It's your current. It's your current. Um, and and um, you know. It's projected to some extent. So if your last year's was 40, <laughs> um, that's relevant, obviously. You know, because if you're applying and you're not, you know, half of that, it's projected. We understand that. Um, we'll look at the, you know, we'll look at the year before as well. You know, there isn't okay. that. But it, it, you're only halfway through the year, basically, or one quarter in. Does that make sense? Thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, a clarification about the capital expenses. Yes. It sounds like they, <clears throat> forgive me, capital expenses are permitted if they're directly related to the project and if the nonprofit owns the property or has a long term lease. Correct. Right. So you're not looking for capital grants per se, but if the project had capital expenses directly related to it, right. that would be acceptable. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you for clarifying. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just a quick question. If the lead organization is not in Monmouth County, would we still be considered? You would, as long as the project is going to serve Monmouth County. So we do get some organizations where they're you know, headquartered outside. It really is about delivery of the project and benefit to Monmouth County residents. That's the key thing. Thank you. <coughs> Um, so if you're not the lead organization, but you're collaborating with another organization, are you able to apply two times? Like if you're able to apply with collaboration and then able to apply no. alone? No. Okay. No, actually, that's a really good point. You are um, really going to apply, whether as a collaboration or as, a, as, a, as an individual organization, once within that process. Yeah. But thank you for that question. That was very helpful. Any more questions? Okay, great. So I'd love to um, introduce our panelists. So as I mentioned, this is a new addition to our info session. Um, it Garden State uh, were the ones that sort of recommended it. They uh, recently introduced it, and um, they said how it really added a dynamic, a different dynamic for all of you. So we, we wanted to do it as well. And uh, welcome. So we have Anna Diaz White from 180 Turning Lives Around. And do you want to come? And Laurie Lewis, this is a bit like a game show. <laughs> Covenant House. <laughs> and Stacey Donovan from Mental Health Association of Monmouth County. We have two mics, but I guess we could just pass that one. Yeah, so I'm going to go question by question. Thank you so much, ladies, for being here today with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And um, I'll start with our first question. Which is really, if you could just briefly describe the mission of your organization and the project which you, for which you received the grant. Thank you, Stacey. I'll start with um, our mission. Um, it's a little lengthy, so I apologize. But for over 68 years, the Mental Health Association of Monmouth County has been providing advocacy and services to families in Monmouth County and identifying the gaps in the mental health system of care in collaboration with community and county and state partners to close those gaps. Our work is driven by our commitment to promote mental health as a critical part of overall wellness, including prevention for all, early identification and intervention for those at risk, and services for those who need them with recovery as a goal. Our mission is accomplished through our strength-based innovative programs, education, advocacy, community partnerships, and the shaping of public policy. 
Do you want me to go on and speak about the project? Or? Yes, that would be great. Okay, thank you. So our project was the Lifeline School and Community Model, which provides training to local, middle, and high schools using a proven model of suicide youth prevention, intervention, and postvention. And at the same time, it creates core groups of community members to expand that prevention mention, uh, message beyond the school. So our key goals were to provide lifeline training to 50 Monmouth County schools over a two-year span. And this is complemented by our competent community training, which provides to the same towns and communities in which lifelines is being implemented. Good morning. Um, so 180 Turning Lives Around uh, proposed to create a family justice center, which is a one stop shop for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, uh, human trafficking to go to one location and to get as many of the services that they need to access in one visit. So prior to the creation of the family justice center, victims would have to go to as many as 20 different places, 20 different appointments, countless phone calls, and the process would continue for weeks, if not months. Uh, and oftentimes, as, as I mentioned in our uh, proposal, you know, they weren't just beaten by their batter, they were beaten down by the system that was created to, to help them. So they, with the Family Justice Center now, they meet with the prosecutor, with detectives, with uh, other law enforcement, with an attorney, with a counselor, uh, with a child, uh, children's counselor. And as many of the appointments are set up that day um, as possible. And they actually see people, uh, a number of people that day. They can even get a restraining order. Um, so it's a it's a fabulous uh, model that's been proven to statewide. And uh, we're delighted that, that we were chosen to uh, do that project. Um, is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Great, All thank right. you. <laughs> Could I just ask, um, we're being recorded, so if you could speak into the mic as much as possible, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Good morning. Covenant Health's mission, in a nutshell, is to help young people exit homelessness and obtain and maintain a positive living environment. We received funding for a new home in Asbury Park called Vice of Passage, um, basically the goal of which is to help young people obviously have a safe and stable place to stay and help them to obtain the skills that they need to maintain a positive living environment. Thank you. So the next question is, in your application, how did you explain the ways in which your project aligned with impact funding priorities? Target an underserved population, highlight an unmet need, and have a high impact on beneficiaries, and what evidence did you provide and support? So in our narrative, we said that lifelines save lives, and that the program increases resilience and coping strategies in our youth. And the funding that we receive brings us one step closer to making sure that every student in Monmouth County knows what to do and where to get help when they need it. By raising community awareness, we reduce the stigma and the shame that prevents our young people from seeking help before suicide ever becomes an option. Sadly, there are few suicide prevention resources in our schools, yet the most recent research by the Center for Disease Control reports that in New Jersey alone, 29% of high school students have reported feeling so sad or hopeless for two weeks that they were unable to perform their normal activities, and 14% seriously considered suicide. Since schools are the natural course of the first place for parents and guardians to go to look for help with their children, it's important that the teachers and the staff are prepared to respond supportively to those concerns. So the project, it says, it targets on people that exhibit anxiety, depression, bullying, sometimes substance use, and stress related to academic and athletic performance and sadly, potentially suicide. Although there is some basic training that teachers receive, it's not enough to keep up with the faculty and staff to identify warning signs and then quickly respond with the right resources for our students. Lifeline integrate, integrates youth suicide prevention into the fabric of the school as it becomes a permanent part of student education, utilizing the health curriculum. So as an agency, we go in and we provide the infrastructure for the faculty and um, key stakeholders in that community to become self-sustaining in order to provide the right prevention and then post-prevention following traumatic loss in their community. Um, so uh, we discussed the fact that one in four women 
will be affected by domestic violence or sexual assault in their lifetime. And then we cited data from the Uniform Crime Report um, that um, specified, you know, exactly what was happening in Monmouth County in terms of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, so, you know, we identified the, the priority needs under, under the uh, guidelines and, uh, and talked about how the project would affect those uh, families. Um, one of the things that was very helpful was that, um, later on we'll talk about this, but we were told to focus on what's the situation now and what's going to be different and therefore what's so impactful about what it is that you're going to do with the project. I highlight the unmet need in our application. We did a needs assessment using external data, so we relied on what's called a point in time count. For those of you who are familiar with homeless services, that's an annual count that's done each year that tells the number of homeless people in each jurisdiction. We also relied on internal data. So we've been working in Monmouth County for about six years. And in the last two to three years, we've had 30 plus young people each year leaving Asbury Park for shelters in North or Asbury, um, Asbury Park Atlantic City because there was no option listed. So we use that to make the argument that yes, there was a need for this home in Asbury Park to serve young people from this community. Um, in terms of the underserved population, again, just do an environmental scan, see who in the area <clears throat> is doing work similar to what you're doing. Um, it turns out Covenant House is pretty much one of the few people in town working specifically with homeless people. Um, in terms of the high tax on beneficiaries, um, this was one we struggled with a little bit because the home is relatively small to start with. It's five beds with rooms that span 10 beds. Um, I think the way we articulated it was that, okay, we're starting with five, but we're having this permanent structure, this permanent building, this permanent support in Asbury Park that was built five this year, five the next year, five the year after. So, I mean, it's a permanent support. And with funding from Impact 100, we're laying the foundation for this support. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, so what were you ready for? And or what did you find surprising about the process? Well, what we were ready for, because our agency in the past had applied for large grants in the wake of Sandy, and we had done that through um, Robert for Johnson and also the Robert Hood Foundation. Sadly to say, I mean, Sandy was a horrible, horrible um, tragedy in our community, but it was a little bit of an easier sell because you had such a direct disaster that required such immediate large funding to serve such a large population. Um, so we expected the historical, we expected the finance, the background, the scope of the project. What we did find surprising though was in comparison to other grants that we had applied for, the thoroughness of the application itself, the process, and the thoroughness of the committees that were involved with the application process. And that's from beginning to end. Um, so we were just absolutely floored by the amazing support that we received from our liaisons through Impact 100, who really served as champions to advocate on our behalf. They were as much invested in our project as we were. So it was great to have that type of partner with us because oftentimes, as you know, as, as people applying or organizations applying for grants, you push your button, your grant is off, and you may not hear for six to 12 months if you've received funding. This was communication at every single touch point. So that was surprising, but it was a, a wonderful surprise. Um, so I see a lot of uh, nonprofit professionals and colleagues uh, that I've known for many years. And um, many of us apply to dozens, if not hundreds, of grants a year or you know, every few years. And uh, we know our shtick, right? We know government grants, this is what they're looking for, a foundation grant, this is what they're looking for. And what was incredibly unique and what is unique about Impact 100 is that um, these are families and people right in your community. So you might write a foundation to somebody in Illinois, they don't know anything about New Jersey, you go into the PAC, blah, 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 or maybe it's a corporate foundation officer. Um, with government grants, um, again, they're not looking for an emotional appeal. I mean, <clears throat> usually that emotional appeal has been made to the um, Congress, and then Congress has created the funding, and then 
you know, there's funding to create blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay. So you don't really have to explain why blah, blah, blah is important because somebody already sold that to Congress and they created the funding. So you're really just going into the fact why blah, blah, blah is needed in this In this situation, there's really a need for an emotional hook because that hasn't been made. And so what's, what's important in the community, not only factually, which is what you have to make a case for that, but also emotionally, why, why is this project important to the families in your community? Um, so that, to me, is a, a really unique thing. Normally, we stay away from that emotional hook, really, in a lot of our proposals. And that, I think, is important here. Um, and I think one of the main things that was a surprise, and I've said this many times before, is uh, there's a rehearsal of your presentation. And I have to tell you, you know, it's two or three weeks prior to the real presentation. And I remember thinking, what, what, <laughs> we, what? We have to have basically our proposal ready weeks in advance before our presentation, <laughs> weeks in advance before we're ready to do this. And by the way, it has to be under six minutes. And uh, you better time it just right. Because sadly, at the, at the <coughs> live presentation, uh, once the six minutes hit, they start clapping their hands and you're done. And I can't tell you how heartbreaking it was to see tremendously talented, wonderful proposals cut short in mid set basically. So um, uh, the rehearsal was kind of a shock to me that we had to rehearse it. And it was probably the most important thing in terms of this process for me, I mean, certainly everything stays that, you know, the Impact 100 liaisons, et cetera, were excellent. But in terms of the presentation and practicing the presentation for the membership, having that rehearsal was key for our project because, um, you know, I've hmm, done this before, no problem. We <laughs> rehearsed, you know, the time. Got, you know, we got it under six minutes. It was like five minutes, 45 seconds. I'm done. And, um, the feedback was, you know that whole section you did about blah, blah, blah? We don't care. <laughs> uh, and, and here's what we would have liked to have seen. We would have liked to have seen what, what is the uh, environment now for eviction? What's going to change in terms of the project? Why does it matter? Why would it matter to these women and people in the community? And it was like, oh, yeah, of course. So. Um, to me, the rehearsal was probably the most important thing and also the most annoying, like, but uh, well worth it and a really important thing to pay attention to the feedback you get uh, from the members. Do we have anything to add to that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell it ourselves. Um, we were the ones who applied in a class that we get voted in for the this year and not funded. Um, I think in the first round, the <coughs> what surprised me most was how intense or how detailed the site visit was. Um, so like a lot of the times like foundations come and it's kind of a superficial visit to say, how are you? How is blah, 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 blah. Um, this one I felt like Impact One Hundred really wanted to get to know us as an organization and how what we were proposing aligned with their funding priorities. They wanted to talk about outside of sustainability, some more reached out to our audit and started asking questions. So just a heads up, be prepared to talk about every single thing in your application. And if you're personally not comfortable talking about it, as someone else in the room who's comfortable talking about it, if you need to have your finance director there to speak on audit, have them there. Great, thank you. And just to say with the six minutes, um, that really isn't to be mean. <laughs> that really is to make sure that it's a level and even playing field between all of the presenters. and. Uh, I'm not sure if we mentioned it, but we actually, it's just two, one or two people speaking, no PowerPoint, no bells and whistles, nothing. So it really is as even a playing field as possible between perhaps the bigger organizations and the smaller. All right, so our last question, what advice do you have for future applicants? I think when you're applying for the grant, um, you think of your beginning of the game as your end game. So because you're already fueled and armed with so much information on the steps in the process, when you're applying, I think if we had also kind of looked ahead about if we get to this ne next step, if we get to this next step. So it's really about buttoning everything up, knowing that if you are chosen to get to that site visit, 
make sure that you have your best people in the room to your point is if you have someone if you think it's just going to be your ceo or your executive director and they might be wonderful dynamic people but they don't really know how to talk to the finances as a finance or a person who prepares the budget does so either have that person in the in that site visit with you or have something from them that's prepared do a dry run through to, to come in because the questions are in depth they're to nail down and really get you to that next point so that your application is even stronger going into the final stages of the application process. So as they say, location, 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 budget, budget, budget. Tie that budget to your narrative and really down to the single dollar because we thought when we prepared our budget, our finance executive helped us and we're like, this is wonderful. And then all of a we were peppered with questions. And we're like, well, I didn't see that coming. Um, so really feel like you have your right key stakeholders assigned to each piece of the of the project or application so that you're really, as I said earlier, that you make it so much easier for the committee to run through your application. So everything is three words. Practice, practice, practice. Um, you know, that was probably for us, I think, the most important thing. Many of us make presentations all the time and they're, you know, somebody will say, well, you know, you got five to five to ten minutes. You know, and it's very, you know, I mean, nobody's going to stop you to go 11 minutes or anything like that. And uh, honestly, I practice a lot because um, that night, you know, if you have, you know, you pause to take a breath because you're a little nervous, those additional pauses will get you over your time and your three really. Uh, so five, so I would keep it to five minutes and 30 seconds. And uh I honestly did it over and over and over again in front of staff who um, also gave me feedback and we changed our presentation not only based on the rehearsal feedback but also based on you know the staff saying yeah that 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 really probably belongs at the beginning this other thing belongs at the end you know blah 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 and um, I would practice that um, over and over and over again to try to do that my advice would be to make sure whatever project you're proposing is ready to launch um, i think that was the mistake we made our first time around we wanted to start building but we didn't have building yet so we weren't quite there yet um so just make sure that whatever your project is um you'll be able to spend the money within a short time period it's a very finite window so you have 24 months that's it just make sure that whatever you're doing will fall within that 24 Actually, I think that's such a good point. Uh, just to emphasize, I think it was it's, on, it's in the slides, but any contingencies, any outstanding for permits, that it's really um, a big it's a big part of the decision making process for the committee. And um, I do know the agonizing decision that they had when we knew that they weren't going to get this permit in time, and um, that it was just an unknown, and they couldn't make the decision to select um, Covenant House on that basis. So it is a really, uh, it's an important piece of your timeline. Yes, questions. Great. Jumping off on that last point about ready to launch, it's so common that in the beginning of the grant that there is some lead in time. It's so common in hiring and recruiting and specific things that. Um, right. So that was a good point. Yeah, that point about, I'm sorry, I don't know if anybody said that point yeah. about ready to launch. It's so common when implementing a new grant that the first quarter, you're hiring two ten new staff. Any thoughts on that? I understood that was that getting a, a, a zoning um, ordinance and so on with the campus zoning. Any thoughts about lead in time the first quarter? Of I think that's time? okay. Just speak to it. Say you know, it, it, yes. I mean, we it sounds awfully demanding. All of these um, things that have been raised, but actually, it really is just and uh, speaking to it and and un helping the members understand the necessity of the stages and that this leads through to we've had some projects where it's, it's about a hire of a particular person who's going to deliver the program and they had we need to hire this person in fact 180 we need to hire them but you know that's that was built into it wasn't it and it, it was in Deidre was hired maybe four months into the start of the right. project so I think there's an understanding of that but honestly um, you know if you're fortunate enough to be selected we're really grateful that in fact 100 I mean folks are smart folks and the best thing you can be is transparent transparent about what's going on with your project 
So for us, we were starting a brand new initiative and um, we had the opportunity to get free space through the county. And so we thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to not spend money on rent and utilities and stuff like that and be able to, you know, put that money back into services as opposed to, you know, building. But that ended up taking a lot longer than um, we had hoped. So that slowed some things down. So we did a soft launch. We were providing services uh, kind of at, at another site. Then we, we provided them kind of, uh, we had the staff person running around like crazy uh, providing services. So I'm honestly, they're a great group. And I think being transparent and letting them know as you implement it, you know, if something comes up, I mean, we didn't intend this to happen, but if something comes up that either slows you down or whatever, I mean, you know, you're focused on getting it done. And as long as they see that you're totally focused on getting it done and there's concrete progress, I think you're okay. Any more questions? Yes. I have one. Um, I know the grant, you go, you do your presentation at the end of November, and you're told whether you have it or not. Do you base your funding on a January through December fiscal year? Um, we base ours on a July 1st through June 30th fiscal year, and our programs pretty much run the school year. How would we have that six-month lead time? Very good question. I wish Michelle was here right now um, in terms of... Um, so we do ask that the project launch isn't going to be too far into, the, you know, we've got the 24-month um, period from when you sign the agreement. Mostly that agreement is signed in December, beginning of January, and then you've got 24 months from there, if that's what you choose the period to be. And um, I, I say, you know, we're looking for a launch of some activities and, and ideally a payment to be made if you say it's defined at the beginning of January, it, by the first quarter, you know, I would say, because, the, you know, the, the members want to be able to, to sort of see some, uh, some activity. And so does that give you a sense? So you can base it off um, your financial year still, I think, but you, we would like to yeah. also work with you in, in, the, in the implementation of the, the, the plan, if you like, in that grant agreement. Does that make sense? Well, I was going to say, and also to the school year, so you could, for instance, be ramping up, be developing curriculum, be hiring people, and then say it's going to go, it's going to start in the fall of, I guess it would be 2019, you know, in, in the next uh, calendar year for the school. That would make sense. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a simple question, which is how many people applied for the grant last year? We had last year 52 applicants. Um, in terms of focus areas, uh, I apologize if uh, the panelists said this already, but which focus areas did you apply under? And then is that, is it considered, do you try to spread the three grants over different focus areas or would it not matter as much if, for example, we are in children and families. Okay, so our committees are divided between the focus areas. So they're all, each committee focused on the ones that come in to that area. We have, um, we, we don't try to spread them evenly, what comes in, what comes in. And um, they are assessed, you know, in that way. And then the, the, the goal is to have one from each of those areas as a finalist. Does that make sense? So your five finalists is one from each area. Do you want to speak to what you applied into and why? I think we did children and families. Um, it just made the most sense in terms of the population we serve. Right, exactly the same for us. It was children and families. So I'm not sure if the reason you're asking the question was because maybe you're deciding which focus group you should apply for. Because oftentimes with the Mental Health Association, um, we sometimes struggle do we fall into the uh, health and wellness component or do we fall into the children and family services? And sometimes you could go either way because in, with mental health you can make a case that is uh, you know, tied very closely to overall general health and, you know, and behavioral health. Um, so, but because ours were so focused on youth suicide prevention, children, and of course that has a ripple effect on our families as well, 
that um, are focused with children and families. But I think you have to really like drill down on what your project is to decide which category you think is going to have the greatest impact. Okay, I think I know what um, our focus area would be. But then just to clarify it so that we'd be competing with the similar focus area in the beginning to become a finalist and then the finalists compete for the correct you would be everyone in that category would be who you'd be competing on every day yeah. yeah okay yeah thank you you want health and wellness <laughs> health and wellness Children and family, children and family. Could you comment on what percentage of your um, budget was fulfilled by the grant? So in our case, it was, um, it we were, had, oh, we're about, I mean, yeah, round about. Uh, I'm going to say, even in our proposal, all the funding wasn't coming from impact. You know, our organization was contributing a portion of the funds too. Um, as it turns out, we were able to leverage other grants because of the impact grant. And so I'm going to say 60-40 impact and other funding ultimately. But I think in our proposal, it might have been 80-20 or 75-25, something like that. I think ours was maybe 70% impact funding, 30% other funding. Hi, um, I'm curious about the uh, allocation of the liaison. It sounds as though they're an important part of prepping the application and the presentation process. Okay, great question. So it's volunteer based, everything that we do. So we're really looking for women who would like to go on the site visit, would like to lead that effort, would like to be involved to that extent, because we have women who, um, you know, they have their memberships and they just vote, and then we have women who are very, very involved at the committee level. Um, so it's a democratic process. Uh, the committee say who would be interested in attending the site visit. We try to encourage them to do more than one, so they've got some comparison. Um, and we ask for a, a, a site visit captain, we call them. And so that group is you know, tasked with going and um, representing impact and then coming back and, and representing the organization. Um, but it is very much on a voluntary basis. Um, we have training and we have, you know, we try to ensure consistency as much as we can and a process as much as we can. But um, yeah, and as I said, some overlap. So there's a comparison in that discussion between one site visit and another. And just one follow up question. Uh, the uh, dry run of the presentation is that for the entire membership of the Giving Circle, or is it just for? So we actually are really blessed in that Community Foundation of New Jersey uh, give the feedback. We felt that a third person would actually just give that, you know, that objectivity. And so they come and they give the feedback. We are there, and so is the liaison, because we want to provide support and ask questions. Um, but the, 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 our very kindly CFNJ are the ones that give the actual feedback to the presenters. Um, actually, you raised something that I thought was really interesting um, in our process. You may be tempted to do your presentation before you submit your application almost in a, in a sort of rough way, because I feel that, that it really brings out and highlights the strength. And so when we're talking about getting to finalists and therefore practicing your presentation, and you're thinking, well, I've got to get through to the last five in order for that to be relevant. Actually, the more I'm listening to your feedback, it may be something that you say, is this something that I would present? Because while it is about the heartstrings, it's also about the story and putting it into the application in that very convincing way. I just thought it was really great feedback from, from you. Uh, I actually had a question, but if I could make a quick comment because I think you touched on something important. I, I kind of have a unique role because I am an impact member, but I'm also a grant writer, so I've been on both sides of the fence. And I truly respect the leadership of this group in terms of advocating that we all are very serious about any conflicts of interest, separating ourselves from any nonprofits that we know and love. Uh, just being completely candid. I don't often see that in my work. We all kind of have our little kingdoms and we all feel very 
very passionately. And I will say, being on both sides of the fence, having written some of the applications and reviewed some of the applications that I had nothing to do with, that they take that role very seriously. And I just think that's critical in a small community where a lot of us know and respect one another. I think that's very important. So I just wanted to, to share that. Um, my question was Monmouth County focused. I think um, with the suicide prevention of 180, it's very clear your countywide impact. With Covenant House, can you touch upon, because I thought you did a great job with this, um, telling your Monmouth County story, i.e. you were not applying for an Asbury Park only grant. You talked about countywide focus. Can you tell us how you think you did a good job with that? Because your facility's in Asbury, so I think that that's important for some of us who might be in the specific town. Thank you. And just to add to that, we are a statewide organization, so it was even more critical for us to focus specifically on Monmouth County. Um, so I guess our argument was like, although we're based in Asbury Park, and we have the numbers to show it, um, we do serve young people from all over Monmouth County. So Long Branch, Kingsburg, Kingsburg. I'm sorry, I didn't know these things very well. Um, so like we have like, numbers from each one. So although we're physically based in Asbury Park, and the house is going to be in Asbury Park, we do take young people from the entire county. Here I am, some voice again. Um, just a little bit on what she touched on. A lot of, because we are such a tight knit community, I'm just curious, a lot of people that are involved with Impact 100 are also involved with our organization. Where does that kind of lie if, if there's conflict? What are your policies on that? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important point. It is very important to us. So, what we'll do is we'll um, have people, uh, uh, we have two stages actually. One is the world that you're in, please, we have a conflict of interest policy. You need to read that and you need to sign that at the very beginning. But then we have a second round where these are the applications, these are the applicants that have um, applied into your area, into your focus area. Please make sure there are no conflicts. And it's, it's a significant affiliation or financial interest. So, you know, we, we try not to be too, too conservative, that it would stop the passion on these, uh, these, these, these committees. It's important that they're passionate and supportive of, of their environment. But, but if, there's, if they're a board um, of an organization, uh, if they are an employee of the organization, um, you, you know, and also we do want the member to sort of self, um, you know, to, yeah, self-police, I guess, <laughs> strange words, but, um, you know, if you're not going to feel comfortable and able to provide an objective opinion, um, be mindful of that, because it's not going to help the discussion or the organization of that. Oh, and we all, yes, one vote, one woman, one vote. So to sway any any sort of decision making would be, yes, yeah, it is very important actually, yes. Yeah. So the entire membership, every woman, one woman, one vote. So. Um. Okay, so, well, thank you so much for coming and good luck if you apply and we look forward to hearing from you.